Good morning. Welcome to our service at Mount Calvary today on the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, this morning our service will follow the service of morning praise that begins on page 45 in the front of our hymnal. We will replace the uh, morning praise hymn on that page with our opening hymn, though, hymn number 393, the first four verses. Uh, we'll sing those after the candles have been lit, and they will be lit after we watch the September edition of the Wells, or the bells rather, have been rung, and they'll be rung after we uh, watch the September edition of the Wells Connection.
us worship him. Tied to your feet like sandals, 
At all times, hold up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Also, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. At every opportunity, pray in the Spirit with every kind of prayer and petition. Stay alert for the same person, or for the same reason, always persevering in your intercession for all the saints. Pray for me also, that when I open my mouth, a message will be given to me that boldly reveals the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may speak about it boldly, as it is necessary for me to speak. This ends the epistle lesson. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel is taken from St. Mark in chapter 7, reading selected verses of the Lord's interaction with the Pharisees and an example of what the Lord had forbidden, which we'll see later in our Old Testament. The Pharisees and some of the experts in the law came from Jerusalem and gathered around Jesus. They saw some of his disciples eating bread with unclean, that is, unwashed, hands. In fact, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they scrub their hands with a fist holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions they adhere to, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, kettles, and dining couches. The Pharisees and the experts in the law asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Instead, they eat bread with unclean hands. Jesus answered them, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching human rules as if they were doctrines. You abandon God's commandment, but hold to human tradition, like the washing of pitchers and cups, and you do many other such things. He called the crowd to him again and said, everyone, listen to me and understand. There is nothing outside of a man that can make him unclean by going into him. But the things that come out of a man are what make a man unclean. In fact, from within, out of people's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual sins, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, unrestrained immorality, envy, slander, arrogance, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and make a person unclean. This ends the Gospel lesson. If we join in our seasonal response printed in our worship folder. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Please be seated for the hymn of the day.
grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. For our consideration this morning, we turn our attention to the Old Testament lesson from Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning with the first verse. So now, Israel, listen to the statutes and the ordinances that I am teaching you, and carry them out, so that you may live and go, and so that you may enter the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving to you, and take possession of it. Do not add to the word that I am commanding you, and do not subtract from it, so that you keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you. Keep them and put them into practice, because in this way your wisdom and your understanding will be recognized by all the people who hear about all these statutes, and they will say, This great nation is certainly a wise and understanding people, because what other great nation is there that has a God as close to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call on Him. What other great nation is there that has statutes and ordinances as righteous as this entire law that I am presenting to you today? This is the Word of God. Dear friends in Jesus Christ, our Lord, we wouldn't change a thing. Those were the words of Mom and Dad as they came to their adult daughter's apartment at her invitation for dinner and then to see what she had done with the place that she had just moved into a week earlier. They liked how it was decorated, especially considering that she had limited experience, limited items, and an even more limited budget. She had done it very well. Mom gave her stamp of approval to the relief of her daughter. Sometimes that's the case, that something is done so well that it can't be improved upon. Other times, you know, maybe there are a few things we would adjust, a little bit at least. In Deuteronomy, we find Moses and the Israelites assembled on the eastern shore of the Jordan River. The children of Israel are soon to enter the Promised Land. Moses won't be going with them. So he gives them the law of God a second time and, and expands on it, reminds them of what God wants. These were people, remember, who in many cases weren't even alive when the law was given at Mount Sinai. If they were alive, they were young. And they may not have remembered what God had said. And, Maybe their parents hadn't done a good job of passing the information along. But Moses wants to give them a last tutorial before they enter into the promised land. And so he lays out before them all of God's law summarized for us in the phrase, the statutes and the ordinances. And as the Israelites heard those statutes and ordinances of God, it was Moses' desire that they would come to one conclusion. The same conclusion that really you and I would hopefully come to when we hear God's statutes and ordinances, His laws and His decrees, I shouldn't change a thing. That's exactly what Moses told the Israelites. Don't change a thing. Don't add to what God says. Don't subtract from it. Now, when we look at the ordinances and the statutes that the Israelites were given, they fall into three basic categories. Excuse me, categories. There was the civil law. God directed the affairs of the people of Israel on a very regular basis, and he defined things like property rights and the way you would inherit property from previous generations. He regulated all of those things. There was the ceremonial law, which applied to their worship life. And God was very specific that you will worship on the seventh day and you will bring certain sacrifices of animals or grain for certain things. And you will do this at certain times every year. And then there was the moral law, summarized by the Ten Commandments, as to what people ought to do or not to do in their relationship both to God and to their fellow humans. Moses wanted the people of Israel to realize the importance of these laws and the value of them. He would go on to say that if you obey these laws, you will receive the recognition of all the nations around you and you will receive their uh, praise 
because they will marvel at how smart and wise you are to follow these wonderful laws given to you. And all of them were wonderful laws. They were all designed to make their lives better, whether it would be their life on earth or their life in eternity. And so Moses said, if you follow them, your lives will be better. Other people will recognize what wise and smart people you all are for following the laws of your God, and they will recognize the fact that you have a God who is unlike any other God out there. The false gods, of course, he was referring to, because the God of Israel was close to his people, interacting with them, giving them these statutes to follow for their benefit. But Moses wasn't only talking to the children of Israel. He was talking to the children of Israel who were simultaneously sinful people. We know they were sinful people because their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents were buried in various locations over the Arabian desert where they had died in the last 40 years because they decided that they knew better than God at one point in time. And so Moses, realizing that apples stay pretty close to the trees on which they grew once they fall, understood that the people entering the promised land could also get the idea that, you know what, maybe we should add to some of the laws God's given us. Maybe some of his laws could be shaved off a little bit, and it'll be better that way. And so Moses says, don't add to what God says, don't subtract from it. And we see that Moses, by God's inspiration, was on to something. In the Gospel lesson, the Pharisees accused Jesus' of disciples of violating the traditions of the elders, about washing one's hands. The elders had come up with things that God had not said. They added to the commands God had given them. As if you could improve upon something from the throne of God. In other cases, they had subtracted from what God had told them to do. And that too was sinful. But at the heart of it is as to why they would do something like that. And you need to think about that. Why would you ever add to what God has given to you? Why would the Jews have ever subtracted from anything? And I suppose it comes down to the fact that somewhere along the way, someone or some ones of them thought, you know what? I think we know better than God. Yeah, what God said to our ancestors was good for them. But over the years, things have changed and, and we've come to realize that, you know, there's some different ways of doing things and we've got ideas. God probably hadn't thought of these. We have. And we're going to make some changes. And so they did. They added things. They subtracted other things that they didn't like. So much so that many generations after Moses, the people of God's chosen nation were so corrupted by what they were doing in worshiping false gods, in ignoring the will of the true God, that the Lord sent most of them into uh, exile, never to be seen again. And within 200 years, the rest of them were sent into exile for a couple of generations. Now that was all some 3,500 years ago that Moses received these, or gave these words to the Israelites. We don't live in those times. And yes, the Old Testament is full of a lot of neat history and, and salvation history, but that neat history, or not so neat if you're not a fan of history, does have application for us, and so do the principles, the statutes, and the ordinances of God. His civil laws do not apply to us. God has established government, but not any specific kind. Our representative republic is no more godly than a monarchy, in many ways. God does not dictate our ceremonial laws. He does not dictate to us as much how we worship as he did to the Old Testament people. We can worship on a Saturday or on a Sunday. We could do it any day of the week we want, any time of the day. We are allowed to eat pretty much any food we want as long as we like it and it agrees with us. We do not bring offerings of sheep and goats, much to the delight of the usher who would have to bring those things forward. We are free to worship 
in many ways that the Israelites could have never dreamed. But the moral law of God, summarized in the Ten Commandments, is still in effect. We know this because in the New Testament, our Lord Jesus himself cites the moral law and says, this is what God wants you to do. The New Testament also tells us that there is no more obligation to the ceremonial law. Paul told the Colossians, those things are a shadow of the things to come. The Sabbath and the new moon festival and all of those things. Don't let anybody judge you according to those things. But the moral law... That's not a temporary thing. That's not a situational law for the Old Testament people. And so what Moses told the Israelites, Moses tells you and he tells me, don't add to what God says and don't subtract from it. And to be honest, if we took a, an assessment of what God tells us, and if we lived according to God's Ten Commandments, our lives would be so much better. And if everybody lived according to the Ten Commandments, everyone's life would be so much better. We wouldn't be afraid of people harming us or harming our property. No one would gossip about us. We wouldn't gossip about others. We wouldn't desire what other people have. We'd be content with what we possess. We would use God's word and God's name as it ought to be used. But we realize, like the Israelites, we don't live in a perfect world. And so the Israelites, that little community of God's people in the land of Canaan, were surrounded by all sorts of nations who influenced them. And some with whom they lived very closely influenced them. And so God's people today, the Christian church, not in its own little geographical place, but scattered throughout the world, we are surrounded by others who are not members of the Christian church, who are not Christian people, who are not godly at all. And this isn't going to be news to you. They influence us. They have an impact on how Christians live. And so over time, Christians have perhaps added to what God has said, subtracted from what God has said. Consider God's second commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Treat God's name with some reverence and respect because it is the name of the Holy God. And so you're flipping through your Facebook posts or you're looking on your Twitter feed and you see three or four different people. OMG! Oh, I didn't say his name. I just used some letters. I don't think God is going to say, well, that's fine. Why do we use his name so casually? Maybe we don't, but we see others who do, and we're influenced by that. We hear children using God's name as if it were some sort of an adjective. They maybe don't know any better. They heard it from their parents. Their parents saw it on television. Their parents got it over their internet exposure. The kids did likewise. We look at any of God's other commandments. The fourth commandment. The fifth. The fifth is a great one to consider. Just this past week. Our good friends down there in the state of Texas, they may not be our friends, we probably don't know most of them. They passed a law making abortion more restrictive. You'd have thought they just tried to make it illegal to breathe the response of some people in our world. And what does their law say? It bans abortion when a heartbeat is detected. A heartbeat is pretty much a good example of life. Right now, every one of you here today probably has one. If you don't, you shouldn't be here. And so, what was considered murder of a living being is now considered something terrible because it infringes upon what? The first commandment of the United States. A person's individual right. A woman's right. Well, let's give the girls a break. Because to my knowledge, though I'm no biologist, no woman gets pregnant on her own. You know, you wake up one morning, you got a sore throat. Not quite sure why. Nobody wakes up one day pregnant and wonder where that came from. We all know what happens. It takes two. So, we will add to or subtract from the fifth commandment because we totally added to or subtracted from the sixth commandment. We don't care about morality. We'll do whatever we want in the name of individual freedom. That's the first commandment of the United States, after all. 
And you and I as Christians, dear friends, don't live in a vacuum. We hear this stuff, we see this stuff, our children hear this stuff, our children see this stuff, our children are tempted. And maybe we've even tried to talk to them, but they're not going to listen. Now they've added to or subtracted from commandment number four. They don't honor their father and mother or others in authority. They'll do what they want because that's what the world does. And if you say anything about them, not only will they not honor you, but they will say all kinds of bad things about you on social media. There goes the eighth commandment. See how easy it is, dear friends? I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and says to themselves, today I think I'll violate God's will. Certainly no Christian would get up and say, today how many ways can I add to what God has commanded me or subtract from it? But Christians today, like Israelites in Moses' day, are also sinners. And so there is a part of us that wants to change God's will to make it more appealing to us, make it more palatable for us, put ourselves in charge which is a violation of commandment number one in God's law, you shall have no other gods. And we ought not to make ourselves above God, but we sometimes do. When those things happen, whether it be us or our family or other people that we know, then it's good to remember another statute of God, not a law, but a principle. That principle is this, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. In other words, the principle of the gospel. That God, for the sake of his son Jesus Christ and because of his son Jesus Christ, has taken away our sin. And that all who believe in that have eternal life to look forward to. That is something we ought never to add to and subtract from. And every Christian would say, well, who would ever do that? Oh, oh it's quite easy to do, isn't it? Yes, I believe in Jesus and I also do these things. So I know I'm going to get to heaven. The wise Christian would simply stop when they say, I believe in Jesus, period. End of conversation. Whatever I do in addition to that doesn't get me to heaven. Does it get me a better seat in heaven? Does it get me closer to God's throne in heaven? But Jesus gets me to heaven. And faith in him does. And so even the gospel can be added to or subtracted from by a Christian if we're not careful. And so we hold God's word in our hands and our hearts and we live according to it, careful not to add to nor subtract from. It's difficult to do, especially because of the world in which we live and the people that surround us and the sinful nature that is within us. But remember this one thing, dear friends. Our God loves us and our God forgives us. And it is that forgiveness which not only relieves us of the fear of punishment, but then moves us and motivates us to actually do what Moses told the Israelites, and he tells us not to add to God's word, not to subtract from it, but to simply follow it. As difficult as it might be, we follow it because our Lord followed it, and because he gives us the strength to follow it. Mom and Dad were impressed with their daughter's decorating skills. She must have learned them at home. Good job, Mom. They wouldn't have changed a thing. As you and I survey the will of God and the Word of God that He has laid out for us, may we echo the words of those parents with a minor variation that I wouldn't and I shouldn't change a thing to what God has told me. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join to praise our God with the Te Deum on pages 48 and 49 of the hymn.
we have received in abundant measure from your gracious and loving hand. And now it is our desire to praise you through this offering. For Jesus' sake, forgive our sins of selfishness that might keep us from returning a greater portion. Fill us with the Spirit's gracious power that our gifts might better reflect your great love for us. Amen. Service continues on page 50 in the front of our hymnals with the Kyrie. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer.
being with us today. Uh, thank you to our organists, to our ushers for their work in our service as well. As you leave this morning, you are welcome to stop at the little table in the entryway. There are some veggies out there again, so take as much as you would like uh, until they're gone. Um, also, there are still some copies of the September Ford in Christ available on the back table. If you haven't taken one, you're welcome to do so. And also meditations, even a large print snuck back in here, so if you'd like to take one of those, uh, we do have one of them available. Uh, in the Ford in Christ, of course, uh, many fine articles. One of them, about a couple down in Florida, um, who actually was kind of interesting. My wife and I had gotten to meet them uh, because they served, uh, they're members of the church where Joel had vicared and uh, got to know our kids quite well. So that uh, was interesting to us anyway, uh, might be interesting to you as well. Uh, also this morning, a reminder that next week we'll be starting uh, Bible class and Sunday school after church, kind of at their usual times and places. Uh, we'll still have fellowship before then. As you leave this morning and, and pretty much every Sunday too, just as a member, we, we haven't done a lot, but we don't put much in there, but every now and then things show up in your mailbox. So please do check your mailbox, if not every week, at least every other week, in case someone puts something in there for you. Uh, there are some things out there that may be of, uh, of interest to you. Uh, as mentioned, uh, uh, Jay Padella was not able to be here today. However, even though he normally serves on the first Sunday of the month, we do have refreshments. Fear not. There's still his coffee and donuts. Uh, we have the B team uh, subbing for Jay, so they'll be out there serving. You are more than welcome to have something as you leave today to enjoy some fellowship and refreshments. Again, we wish you the Lord's blessings on your week ahead.